All right, so my project is called Virtue Epistemology Unexplored Territory. I think now I'd probably retitle that Not Wholly Explored Territory or something like that. Lots of folks have uh, started working on many of the projects that I took to be new when uh, I began this grant work. Uh, before I get going, I want to say a quick word of thanks to the John Templeton Foundation to Wake Forest University and to Whitworth University, my home institution. Without those institutions, this work wouldn't have been possible. All right, so what I want to present today is uh, a part of a paper that's um, sort of in my project. Um, so this is uh, some work on responsibilist virtue epistemology and how that might come in for criticism from situationism. So just some setup remarks. Um, many, of you knew, many of you know, maybe all of you know, situationism is the view, at least as applied to virtual, virtue ethical theories, that human subjects lack the character traits that figure prominently in those theories. This ends up being a problem for virtue ethicists because at least some virtue ethical theories are not just normative theories, but they're empirically predictive. So the charge here is that virtue ethics presupposes an empirically inadequate psychology. All right, now enter virtue epistemology, in particular, virtue responsibilism. This is a view on which intellectual virtues are sort of modeled on Aristotelian character virtues. So on this view, intellectual virtues are stable and excellent dispositions of cognitive character. Um, and you see some examples there, right? Courage, open-mindedness, curiosity, and so on. Given the prominence of the situationist critique of virtue ethics, and given the increasing prominence of virtue responsibilism in epistemology, it was just a matter of time before the situationist critique in virtue ethics was expanded to virtue epistemology. And in a fascinating recent paper, Mark Alfano makes just that application. So he has this very nice paper in Phil Quarterly in which he employs situationism as a critique of responsibilist virtue epistemology. I'll say a bit more about what that is in a moment. The charges here are first that human subjects lack responsibilist virtues, at least construed as global character traits. Um, the second charge is that th that very lack leaves responsibilism open to um, charges of skepticism and empirical inadequacy. So first I want to just clarify the targets of the criticism here. We can do that by noting some different varieties of virtue epistemology. So first, there's what we might call pure reliabilism. This is a view defended by folks like Ernest Sosa and John Greco. Here the thought is, right, intellectual virtues are capacities or powers, dispositions that tend to lead their possessors to true beliefs rather than false ones. That view is not going to be one of the targeted views here. Another kind of virtue epistemology is what we might call pure responsibilism. And this is the way Alfano carves up the territory. Here intellectual virtues are modeled on Aristotelian character virtues, just as uh, I said a moment ago. And then third possibility, mixed virtue epistemology. That's a kind of epistemology that employs both reliabilist and responsibilist elements. Right, so the targets here are just any view, any, any view that incorporates responsibilist elements. So uh, those will be pure responsibilism and mixed virtue epistemology. Within virtue responsibilism, we have two further varieties. First, there's what we might call classical responsibilism. This is a kind of responsibilism that takes the notion of intellectual virtue and uses it in analyses of epistemic properties like knowledge and justification. Um, that kind of epistemology is primarily interested in traditional epistemological questions, questions like what is knowledge, what is justified belief. Then there's inquiry responsibilism, which distances itself from that analysis project, at least as it, as insofar as it concerns knowledge or justification, and instead analyzes properties like understanding, wisdom, and then just um, virtuous inquiry, or the concept of a virtuous inquirer. So we see treatments of individual intellectual virtues under that rubric. All right, 
So now I'm going to outline the situationist problems for virtue responsibilism that Alfano sets out in his paper. The first of these is a critique of classical responsibilism and the second of inquiry responsibilism. So with respect to classical responsibilism, Alfano sets out an inconsistent triad. Um, so first, non-skepticism. Most of us know quite a bit. Second, classical responsibilism, as I've just set it out, right? Knowledge is true belief acquired and retained through responsibilist intellectual virtue. And then epistemic situationism, right? Most of us don't have the traits that virtue responsibilists talk about. So the way this goes is responsibilism looks like it requires that we possess these traits in order to have knowledge, but situationism says we don't have the traits so we don't have knowledge. So um, non-skepticism, sort of taken as a datum here. Situationism, Alfano takes to get support from empirical psychology. So to get out of the puzzle, he thinks we ought to reject classical responsibilism. All right, now the critique of inquiry responsibilism. Here's the basic thought, right? Inquiry responsibilists, though they don't engage in this direction of analysis thesis, and so they're not subject to the charge of skepticism, they nevertheless appear to be committed to the claim that subjects have these responsibilist virtues. Alfano thinks that's wrong. He thinks that lots of studies in social psychology show that subjects lack those traits, uh, at least construed as global traits. He thinks that what most of us have are local traits, traits like this. Um, um, courage when um, not faced with unanimous dissent, or creativity when in a good mood, traits like that. So he thinks a lot of our epistemic conduct, maybe most of it, can be explained without appeal to responsibilist traits, and this leaves responsibilism open to charges of empirical inadequacy. All right, very fairly quickly, what's the evidence for epistemic situationism? Alfano cites many more studies than I'll be able to run through here, but let me just run through a few that I take to be some of the more impressive. First, some work by Alice Eisen and colleagues on the Dunker candle task. So here's the, the problem. This is supposed to be a measure of creativity. So subjects are given a box of tacks, a book of matches, and a candle. There's a cork board on the wall, and the task is to affix the candle um, to the cork board in such a way that when the candle is lit, no wax drips on the floor. There's only one solution that really works for this. You have to empty the box of tacks, use the tacks to fix, affix the box to the cork board, and then set the candle on top of the box. Eisen and colleagues found that in the control group, right, uh, those folks who were just sort of given the task and, and no additional um, prompting, no additional uh, effect conditions, only 13% of those folks solved the task. By contrast, subjects who were either given candy or who watched a short comedy right before given the, being given the task, they solved the problem in 75% of the cases. Second study, this is on what's called the remote association test. So the way this test goes is as follows. Subjects are given a triplet of words. So triplets like sore, shoulder, and sweats, or room, blood, and salts. And they're asked to supply the word that matches, right? The fourth word that forms a compound when uh, joined to the others. So the solutions for those above are cold and bath. Here again, Eisen and colleagues found that subjects in the positive affect condition fared much better than the control group. So uh, they solved something like 66% more of the, the moderately difficult problems than those in the control group. The inference that Alfano draws from this is that the subjects um, who solved the problems didn't exhibit the virtues as such, rather they exhibited uh, virtuous behavior because they were given epistemically irrelevant uh, prompting or uh, candy or, or a film. So this is evidence that the subjects didn't have the traits as such. 
All right, additional studies. These are on intellectual courage. And here Alfano focuses on some work on what's called the autokinetic effect. So this is work by uh, Mufazer Sharif. And so this room isn't totally dark, so you can't see exactly what's going on here. But suppose we're in a completely dark room, and the only thing you could see is just one stationary beam of light. You're placed in this room. After a while, that light's going to look like it starts to move. Not because it's moving, but because your eyes wander. Sharif put um, Confederates in, the room, in, in this room with subjects and then asked the Confederates to make judgments about how much the light was moving. They'd always make very confident judgments and very precise judgments. So the light moved three inches or seven inches or whatever. Um, the way this came out as the research uh, unfolded was that um, subjects almost always caved to the consent of the group. Um, Sharif infers from this that the social pressure affected the way people were viewing reality. Alfano draws a weaker conclusion. He thinks that what follows from the study is that apparent unanimity can generate consent when the object of judgment is highly ambiguous. Um, right? So when the object of judgment is ambiguous, we cave to social pressure. And this is some evidence that we don't possess courage as a global trait. Now he cites additional studies, for instance, the ASH studies, uh, in which the object of judgment is clear and the effect of social pressure is still present. Um, the result of all these studies, though, Alfano thinks, is that the subjects don't have virtues construed as global traits. Um, why think that? Well, here's some additional evidence, right? Think about what's at stake in these experiments. Really, not much other than uh, the possibility of getting scorned by one's colleagues. If that's all that's at stake and subjects cave in those cases, then sort of how much more are they going to cave when it's really time to stand up for their views? Right, so uh, those are just a few studies. We could cite more. Um, Alfano thinks that if the studies uh, that we encounter repeatedly seem to show that, that subjects are subject to these pressures, that casts significant doubt on the claim that we have responsiblest virtues. All right, so really interesting arguments, I think. I'm going to do my best to respond to them. Start with the inconsistent triad argument. And reminder, this is a problem for classical responsibilism, right? And remember how that went. So we have these three inconsistent propositions. We have to give up one of them. Two of them seem pretty plausible, right? Non-skepticism, I think we all go for that. Situationism, I've just shown you some empirical evidence for that. So maybe classical responsibilism is in trouble. Uh, so maybe I could have just asked you to say this, Linda, <laughs> since you're here. Um, so I think in order to make progress here, we ought to get clear on the key responsibilist claim at issue. So Alfano targets uh, Linda's work, um, classical responsibilist work. And the key claim here is that knowledge is a state of true belief arising out of acts of intellectual virtue. And now I think we need to make a crucial distinction that will reveal whether this inconsistent triad argument makes real trouble for classical responsibilism or not. Um, the, the view that was just on the screen can be taken in two ways. There are two versions of it. Here's the first. Knowledge is a state of true belief arising out of acts of intellectual virtue, where those acts right, require that the agent who performs them have the virtues in question. That's one version. Here's the second version. Knowledge is a state of true belief arising out of acts of intellectual virtue, where such acts don't require that the agent who performs them possess the virtues. So um, here's how this distinction gets put to work. If we understand classical responsibilism as embracing version one, then I think the argument goes through, at least if we've got good evidence for situationism. But if we understand it in terms of version two, the argument won't work because the inference from responsibilism and situationism to skepticism will be invalid. Okay, so in other words, the argument requires attributing uh, version one 
to Linda. But as it turns out, she rejects this view. So I've been reading Virtues of the Mind uh, very carefully recently. Here's a relevant passage where I'll highlight the key parts of it. On my definition of an act of virtue, it is not necessary that the agent actually possess the virtue. Uh, the definition permits those persons who do not yet fully possess a virtue but are virtuous in training to perform the acts of virtue in question. So there's more to say here, but I think the upshot is this. Uh, Zagzebski rejects version one in favor of version two, but the argument requires version one. Uh, version two is consistent with that conjunction of situationism and non-skepticism. So I think at least given what we've seen so far, even if social psychology were to show that situationism is true, that wouldn't raise trouble for classical responsibilism. All right, now the second argument. This is against inquiry responsibilism. And reminder, the charge here is that that view is empirically inadequate. Uh, we've seen what the evidence for that is. It's just the studies that we've talked about uh, on courage. That's where Alfano sort of trains his guns. He thinks similar rem remarks apply to creativity, indicates he's uh, pretty suspicious that they'll apply to other virtues as well. So to get a handle on uh, the way he's viewing empirical inadequacy, I think this passage is helpful, right, because this is supposed to show where responsibilist views fail. He says they neither explain nor predict a sufficient portion of epistemic conduct. Um, in order to do that, uh, he thinks, it'd have to be the case that lots of people have these responsibilist virtues. Otherwise, they're not going to have the explanatory power that is needed for empirical adequacy. All right, so um, moving on to evaluating this charge. I think a um, helpful reminder in this context, empirical adequacy should be a measure of what a theory actually predicts as opposed to a measure of kind of our common sense expectations. And now think about what inquiry responsibilism is. At its heart, it's just a set of projects committed to examining properties like understanding, um, wisdom, individual intellectual virtues, what it's like to be a praiseworthy agent, and so on. Just given that, it doesn't look to me like inquiry responsibilism gives us much reason to think that the virtues will be particularly common. Um, all right, but suppose we force the view to make a prediction. Here I think we'll find that the view predicts that the virtues will, will be rare. So on any inquiry responsibilist view, these virtues turn out to be excellences, right? They're not averages, they're not ways in which um, typical epistemic agents behave or character traits that typical agents have. So I think it's going to turn out that even if these virtues are fairly rare, that's not a major problem for inquiry responsibilism. Um, it's not going to show that it's empirically inadequate. Alfano has a reply to this. Uh, he thinks that, that if we, um, if inquiry responsibilists, that is, take the virtues to be rare, that's going to push the view into the realm of the purely normative. It'll be empirically irrelevant. And he takes that to be a significant cost of the view. I think this is a really interesting objection. By way of pushing back a little bit, I think it's helpful to ask what the rarity of the virtues would show by way of the empirical relevance of inquiry responsibilism. So it's true that uh, if few people possess these traits, then inquiry responsibilism isn't going to explain the behavior of typical or average epistemic agents. Um, I think there's a step from there to thinking that it's wholly empirically irrelevant or that it's a purely normative theory. Um, so for instance, I think it might perform empirical uh, functions and regulative functions by way of predicting the epistemic behavior of our best epistemic agents, right? I mean, that's maybe a small number of people, but we still ought to be able to get some, some empirical data on those agents, and uh, the view is uh, consistent with that uh, and fits quite well with it. We might, at the end of the day, end up with empirical data that provides guidance for the rest of us as we seek to become better epistemic agents. So that's just a stab 
at that reply. All right, I want to close by talking a little bit about what the studies show. And there are lots of points that could be made here. I'll end up uh, just limiting myself to one for the sake of time. Uh, but suppose that um, you know, we look at these studies and just ask the question, right, irrespective of what responsibilism is committed to, just ask the question, is epistemic situationism true? Do the studies show that the subjects lack um, virtues construed as global traits? Um, I think that's the case only if the experiments are set up in such a way that it's very likely that virtuous subjects would exhibit virtuous behavior under the experimental conditions. And I think there's at least some room for doubt about this. So um, factors such as native intelligence, training, interests, for instance, interest in solving an experimental task, these things uh, coupled with temperaments, these can make behavioral differences in subjects, all of whom possess the virtues. So unless our experiments are controlling for those factors, they may not end up being reliable tests for the virtues. Remember, all of these factors are distinct from virtue. So just for instance, um, unless tasks like the Dunker Candle task are controlling for IQ or degree of interest, right, they might fail to be reliable measures of these virtues. So maybe some of the subjects who failed the Dunker Candle task did so not because they lacked creativity, but just because they lacked the, the raw cognitive power to do the tasks. Or maybe some of them just weren't really interested in solving the tasks. Um, lack of interest needn't by itself indicate a lack of virtue. So these factors, I think internal factors of the agents that can make for behavioral differences even if um, they aren't differences that reveal a lack of virtue. So I think these explanations have at least some degree of plausibility and that at least um, monkeys with the empirical results um, and the conclusions we ought to draw from them. All right, a few closing remarks. I'm not sure that epistemic situationism has been vindicated, at least not yet. It might be uh, in the future. I don't think just given what we've seen, it's vindicated. I'm certainly open to that possibility. Uh, more sure about this claim, even if it were vindicated, that wouldn't make serious trouble for responsibilist virtue epistemology. Uh, that's because responsibilist views just don't entail empirical claims that are strong enough to get them in trouble with respect to situationist attack. Now, I want to sort of close, uh, because I've kind of been um, down on drawing these inferences from social psychology. Um, clearly, virtue epistemologists should pay careful attention to social psychology. Um, so lots of reasons for this. Um, among the reasons uh, are the following. So if responsibilism is going to provide us any conduct, uh, any sort of uh, regulative advice for our epistemic lives, it's going to have to be the case that sort of regular epistemic agents are at least capable of performing acts characteristic of intellectual virtue. Uh, maybe we don't perform fully virtuous acts, but at least acts characteristic of virtue. If we're not capable of doing that, then we're really in trouble. Uh, but happily, the situationist research itself points in the direction that, that we can perform acts characteristic of virtue. And it might even, uh, coupled with virtue epistemology, help us get some traction so that we can perform those acts more frequently. It might give us advice um, that will help us perform char in characteristically virtuous ways more often. Um, so I think responsibilists should be glad to learn of those kinds of situational inferences that can, uh, influences that can bolster um, the extent to which we display virtue. And responsibles should put that information to good use. They should hope that virtue epistemology and psychology can work together to improve our cognitive conduct. And if they do that, I think Alfano is among the first they should thank for it. Uh, thanks. I saw your hand. You want to? Or, uh, <laughs> yes, you can, you can regulate it. Um, so, um, 
I think you're, it's quite possible in a number of respects what you say. Um, Alfano's initials, uh, some of his initial arguments were a little bit overblown, um, especially um, with respect to construing Linda's view. Uh, but on his behalf, since he's not here, I'll, I'll pretend I'm Alfano and right. say what he might say right. in reply, at least with respect to classical responsible. So he might say, yes, um, uh, Linda's view doesn't require the actual possession of the intellectual virtues. However, it does look like it has some empirical bite to it. Uh, it does require the possession of certain kind of virtuous motives yeah. in order to have uh, knowledge. Yeah. So we can just reposition the situationist attack with, to those and aim it at those motives. Right. And what the pair above is is to, to think that there is uh, cross situationally consistent. Uh, iteratively stable possession of these kind of virtuous motives. Um, yeah. And maybe, in fact, there is a pair of evidence to think that there isn't such yeah. widespread possession of those motives. If that's the case, then we still got skepticism. Good, good. So I think the, the general strategy there is, is right on the money, right? Only, you only need to find one uh, condition such that uh, Linda's account says it's necessary for knowledge, but that uh, very few of us satisfy, and you end up in skeptical trouble fairly quickly. Um, so I guess uh, first question uh, will be, well, what does the research show on this? I'm not in a position to, to talk about that. Um, second sort of thing, I think uh, on Linda's view, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, the motivation in question needn't be anything like conscious motivation where one's you know, aware of uh, the motivation itself. One might possess the motivation more or less in a kind of default mode. Um, that might be a little more resistant to empirical attack. Um, but right, another way to go is if, if this ends up um, still not being something that's subject to possess, if you want to retain the account, then um, you might have to drop out that motivational component. So I mean, those are some options. Uh, I guess we need to do some more work to figure out which one is best. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for this great talk. Um, you seem to be granting that something like oh thanks sir. Um, you seem to be granting that something like flexibility and creativity is the kind of thing that is a responsibilist virtue. Okay. And I do think I think now we've all gotten much better about like saying oh it's not between the reliableist virtues and the responsibilist right. virtues we don't have to choose. But I think a case like this is really interesting with flexibility because it's, it doesn't seem to fall clearly in either camp to me. So I used to. Um, I used to do like uh, improv, like when I was younger or whatever, and I can feel I don't have that kind of flexibility anymore uh -huh. to be able, that kind of, I mean, it's, a, it's amazing when, like, how much people who have that kind of thing take it for granted and how it can go away. And yet I wouldn't say, like, as a, there's, a tr there's a real sense and way of looking at the virtues on a responsibleist picture where I, I haven't lost anything. I've lost something overall in so far as I've lost something that a truth-seeking person or a, a, an understanding-seeking person would want to have. But it seems, even if it doesn't fall exactly more into the reliableist camp, it seems more akin to that or less so of the responsibleist virtues. Yeah. So I, I wondered what you thought about that. And I, I mean, I, th I think all your criticisms were, were dead on, but you seem to grant this point that I, about it, flexibility or, or creativity even being the kind of trait that responsibleists right. take as a paradigm trait. So I, w I wondered if you could speak to that. Right. Well, I don't have much to say other than that, um, you know, in light of remarks like the ones you've just given, it might be fairly plausible to construe traits like creativity as skills or something like that, uh, where that's a skill is something different from a virtue. I think those traits are cognitive excellences in a certain kind of way. So they'll fit the label virtue uh, by way of that, but they won't be virtues of the sort that responsibleists have in mind. Um, yeah, I'd have to think a little bit more about that. I'd want to know sort of what, what's the characteristic psychology of the creative person. Typically, accounts of that um, psychology fall into accounts of individual virtues. And so um, if there happens not to be one, then that's not going to be as good a candidate for a virtue as some other things. Yeah, great question. Linda? Um, this is uh, just a follow-up to Christian. I didn't understand why the situation is critique of virtuous motives would be an objection to my definition of knowledge. I mean, if it turns out that the empirical evidence is that people do not consistently have 
uh, intellectually virtuous motives in different situations, then my definition would predict they don't have knowledge in those different situations. I mean, they could have knowledge in one situation and not another, but I yeah, don't I see it. why that's an objection. I get it. Yeah, good. So it's going to have to turn out, I think, that um, it's going to have to be something like most of us lack these, these motives most of the time or something like that. Yeah. But right, uh, I think that's a good point. Just some studies wouldn't be enough to, to show that unless there was some way of extrapolating from those studies. I mean, if it turns out that part of the time people are motivated to get the truth and part of the time they're really motivated in you know, some other way, yeah. Uh, then I may mean, accept that, that uh -huh. they don't have knowledge in the right. second set of circumstances. Right. Yeah, and you're, I mean, I think you're, you're open to making knowledge a bit harder to get than some other theorists want to make it. So, um, yeah, I think that fits well with your view. Um, Stephen and then Phil. So, I, I, if you could help me out maybe understanding the situationist critique of responsibility a little bit more, that would be helpful to me. So, I'm trying to understand the bite of it. So, um, you know, maybe having candy might help me be more intellectually virtuous, but having, that, that's not so surprising exactly. Like having my cup of coffee makes me a lot more intellectually yeah. curious or intellectually open-minded. If I don't have a nap, I'm pretty grouchy. Maybe I'm less open to other views. Right. I mean, none of that would be particularly surprising that that would help the manifestation of curiosity or open-mindedness. Yeah. And you could also think of those things as just uh, maybe enabling condi conditions that we wouldn't, again, think is so surprising. Maybe we don't, the fact that you have to be in a, a good mood sometime to be more intellectually curious yeah. um, would mean that the good mood is partly responsible for finding the truth in that case. But still, without that trait that was only manifested with the good mood, you wouldn't have gotten to the truth. So the, the trait is still playing a very important role. Yeah, good, good. So I'm sympathetic to a lot of what you just said, um, and I can remember in graduate school you you were much more open to other views after you'd taken naps. Um, so, uh, so I think I think here's kind of what's going on. Um, so there's there's one way in which these studies uh, show the influence of situational factors, in which what they show is right subjects in positive effect groups fare better than subjects in control groups. That's a relative kind of evaluation. What Alfano wants to say is that the studies also test the, the baseline. Um, they test sort of absolutely um, by way of the, the control group. And so what he wants to say is, the fo look, the folks in the control group are faring pretty poorly. So I think that's how he wants to get this um, going. Does that help? Yeah. Phil and then in the back. Um, could you go back a few slides? I learned yesterday from my psychology colleagues. Tell me that when to. That's an acceptable thing. Tell me when to uh, stop. Can I just go back? Um, let's see. Okay, okay, um, okay, go forward. And one more. <laughs> one more. No, no, I'm not seeing it. Anyway, uh, okay, maybe right here, yeah. Let's look at this for a second. So I think the disagreement you have with Alfano is how to characterize empirical adequacy. Um, and I guess that's, that's just a sort of initial comment. But then you made a claim about something like, you know, it, uh, yeah, this first claim here, if the virtues were rare, it would show that responsibility doesn't explain the epistemic behavior of typical epistemic agents. And I don't see why that would necessarily be, especially if you draw the distinction from the earlier part of the paper, because you could say lots of people don't have the virtues, but they still act virtuously on certain occasions. Uh -huh. And so couldn't we then explain those occasions without appealing to the traits, but maybe we have to appeal to motives or something. So we could still explain them. Um, but you, you almost seem to concede too much there. I see, yeah. Uh, yeah, good. I'll have to think about that. Um, maybe I'll end up taking that back, but I think that's a point worthy of reflection. Okay. So this, uh, my comment is uh, related to the point made earlier about is creativity and flexibility a virtue. Most of the recent evidence of the social psychology suggests that when people are 
more creative or primed in some way to be more creative or work on a creative task, it makes them more likely to behave unethically. They lie more, you think of creative <laughs> ways to get around the rules. Uh -huh. um, so I, I think implicit here is that if you're smarter or more creative or flexible or intellectual, that this is a virtue, yet, um, and we can all maybe agree that some of these skills are good, Yet at least within uh, social psychology, we know that creativity is associated with other kinds of things that we think are bad, like lying, cheating on your taxes in creative ways, <laughs> and things like this. So I'm curious how you might reconcile those. Um, yeah, so I guess other than by uh, locking the door to my room, given that I'm in a, you know, a conference with lots of creative people, um, <laughs> I guess the main thing there is to distinguish um, intellectual virtues from moral virtues. This is a thorny uh, area for discussion, but yeah, I mean, it's conceivable. You seem to point to research that suggests that these two things don't always go together, and this would just be an example of that, I would think. I have a question about uh, Fama's interpretation of Sharif's experiment. So, Sharif suggests that the, uh, the testimony of the, the Confederates is affecting people's perception. And yeah. you say Alfano has a more moderate interpretation. Right. And, and what you say is that the, the pressures generate consent yeah. on the part of the, the subjects. And I was wondering what, how he, what he means by generate consent. Is the consent internal or is it just external, where external just means they're assenting to a proposition? Because we might think that's a moral virtue rather than an intellectual virtue, and the intellectual virtue would have to do with an internal consent. I and see. if Alfano means that, then his interpretation might not actually be more moderate than... I see. Okay, so I, I took it that uh, by consent he meant uh, something about what the subjects were willing to say rather than what they were willing to believe. And I think that's why he took it to be more moderate, right? It's a stronger claim to say these social pressures are affecting what people believe than what they're willing to say. Um, now, you might still think that intellectual courage is something that's relevant to being willing to say things. Um, for instance, being willing to stand up for views that you think are true. So I, I don't want to think of intellectual virtues as you know, just traits that help us to get at the truth, uh, but also traits that help us to retain the truth, um, to disseminate true belief and other epistemic goods where that's appropriate. So yeah. intellectual virtues aren't just internal virtues, no, I just those things to yeah. needs and things yeah. like that. Right. Other questions? Christian? Uh, I don't want to go again. Instead of getting those toes. So if there's no one else, I'll come back. Yes. My comment picks up on what Ty has said um, and trying to play around with, OK, so what is the distinction between um, intellectual virtues and behavioral virtues and moral virtues? Um, so if I can understand this correctly, the, what's good about the intellectual virtues is that they allow you to form truly they allow you to have knowledge that is actually knowledge and not just things that you think are knowledge. Um, so that's one motive. Um, if you have the intellectual virtue, would be that when these virtues that you're, you're uh, always, or at least when you've had a nap, striving to understand the world accurately, truly. Um, is it possible for the same people to want to make other people not understand the world truly? And then, use their same abilities in a non-virtuous way by creating false beliefs on, in the IRS or, or uh, whatever. Yeah, good. Uh, so is the, let me see if I've got the question. Is the question, uh, can, intellectually, can intellectual virtues be used for vicious ends? Is that the, yeah. So the, and is it the same, vir is it the same capacity? Is it the same yeah, good. Trait? Good. So there are lots of different ways to go on this. One way to go that, that I find at least fairly plausible is to think of a distinction between, say, intellectually virtuous courage and some other trait that's properly called courage but that's not virtuous. So one thought here, I'm not sure about this, but here's a way to, to try to address your question. You might think that for an intellectual trait to be virtuous, it has to sort of be aiming at a good end. Uh, rather than a, 
a bad end. Um, and in these cases, the goods will be intellectual goods rather than evils like falsehood and ignorance and so forth. So that's an initial stab. Was that a half hand earlier, John? Yeah. Is so, that a real hand? Is it a full hand now? Yeah, we can, so <laughs> this question requires an assumption that we can't say things. So it, to, to reject the, or suggest that you have to come down on the expressing side and not the conformity side <clears throat> with how to think what, what, how, how an epistemic virtue generates knowledge. So you can't say things like he's not virtuous but acts virtuously. At least Aristotle thinks you couldn't, right? But to go to, so, so with that in mind, I wonder if you're too um, sanguine about um, what the rarity response buys us, right? So, <clears throat> so, stipu so stipulate epistemic virtue is rare. Okay, so let's say one in 25. So in this room, is Christian since it's his party, he's <laughs> epistemically virtuous. And the worry is is that the Morian platitude is supposed to be, say, ordinary dry goods knowledge is pretty cheap. So now it turns out one person in this room knows someone is standing at the podium. Okay. Um, so it that could be the thing to see. You could be stern about knowledge and say yeah, it's yeah. right. But the thought is is it's it, at least you have to say it. By the way, I'm being radically revisionary here. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, given if you suppose, if you suppose, as I suppose, on certain re readings of Aristotle, y you might want to suppose that um, a genuinely virtuous, uh, an action done virtuously, as opposed to merely in conformity, and pro implies some notion of expression or something like that. So the person has the disposition, doesn't just act in conformity with the expected output of a disposition. Okay, okay, great, great. So uh, this won't be satisfying, but uh, one thought here is that these are the sorts of problems that plague all kinds of other <coughs> epistemological theories. So, you know, um, certain evidentialist theories, um, theories that require internalist justification for knowledge, they might look like they set the stakes too high, and that might look revisionary. Um, certain externalist theories are often uh, subject to the charge by internalists that they set the bar too low, and so they're revisionary, revisionary in that respect. So, as far as I can tell, at least initially, uh, virtue responsibilism isn't going to be worse off than those other views um, on that count. Now, that doesn't mean uh, that the problem is solved. I'd, I'd like to think more about that. Um, well, one way to set up the dialectic would be what's good about So this is why good old boring externalists, reliableists, like to be good old and boring. And then you say, well, the dialectic here, should you be a responsibleist or reliableist virtue epistemologist, never mind whether responsibleist virtue epistemologists or virtue epistemologists for the purpose of this discussion. But that's the contrast. And they say what we've got right um, is because we have a comparatively undemanding conception of epistemic virtue. What we've got right is that it's not only Christian who knows that there's a man standing at the podium. So it might be that it's f fair enough, everybody's trouble, but if there's a nearby view, right, if there's a nearby view that can plausibly claim not to have the trouble on right. that score, right. it looks like you're rendering it's a anyway. rhetorical disadvantage. Uh -huh. Yeah, good. And then we've got to look at what are all of the other troubles mm -hmm. for. Yeah, you're right. It's, other... a, it's, it's a grocery list, absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Uh, prior to the meeting, Christian advised me that there was some flexibility with respect to the time. We pressed that a little here, but I noted a moment ago that he had a question of his own, so he can be the final judge about how flexible we want to Do you still have a question? Uh, I do, but since I know what the right thing to do is here, uh, <laughs> I, know, uh, I know the right thing to do is to thank you. Okay. Yeah.